was wishful optimism that boarded a flight a few weeks ago. Misperceptions, too. This one of the only airlines still flying into Liberia, into the heart of the worst Ebola outbreak in history. Our mistake to believe a problem so acute would have a compassionate cavalry riding in to save the day. Yet, look at all the empty seats, hardly stuffed with eager aid workers or supplies. The disaster relief nurses who were stepping up, not at all surprised that they didn't have a lot of company. What, what do you think is going on? It's a pretty empty plane. Their response to Ebola, a lot of people are afraid of it still. It takes a little bit of time now that it's kind of been labeled such a cri or fully labeled such a crisis. It just takes some time to really get people up and moving safely, and I think a lot of organizations are concerned about that. It's all been bumpy from the beginning. The rough landing into Monrovia, another reality check. Its runway is so chopped up from neglect, it's in urgent need of repair. Not safe for the world's largest aid planes to land, if that is, the world cared enough to send them. The welcome ritual, so unnerving to see at first, eventually so reassuring to see across the city. Not much else reassures about Monrovia, which is, of course, why Ebola has so embedded itself. The virus has never coursed through a dense urban environment before, never been able to take advantage of so much decay, a country still broken and in ruins after the end of the Civil War. The political ramifications of Ebola. The Ebola discussion that is Liberia's soundtrack now is laced with rage because it didn't have to be this bad. Radio host Henry Costa fumes at spending choices the Liberian government has made. We don't spend money on building health facilities and bringing in equipment. Stuff. We don't do that sort of thing. For example, we didn't have ambulances. Ebola struck before the whole world realized that Liberia did not have ambulances. How can you have a health sector that doesn't have vehicles to convey sick people to and from hospitals. I mean, it's the basic logistic, basic things you need we didn't have. Are you saying that before this country was in an Ebola crisis, that if somebody got into a car accident and needed to go to the hospital, that there was no such thing as an ambulance? No, ma'am. It's true, Liberia didn't have an ambulance system. Those you see screaming by are donated ambulances from charities that in some cases pulled out of the country after the war and never came back. Liberians learned they couldn't count on much. It may be a country filled with the world's best rubber plantations, but that doesn't mean they have nearly enough rubber gloves. Check out this doctor admitting Ebola patients at the government-run island clinic. That ripped glove hardly safe for anyone. Neither are the realities that some health workers are said to be reusing protective gear and that infectious waste is sometimes left just to be carried away by the dogs. That is probably the biggest piece of the Ebola puzzle when you look back on why it's just so bad in Liberia. It is the crumbling healthcare system. That country spends among the least per capita on healthcare in the world. They don't have the basics, which means you don't soon forget the faces of those who are sick and know that means they're in trouble. Has, has somebody been called to come get her? Or? Here's a woman who needed help. One of the rare private ambulances had driven off without her. It was too full. Taxis wouldn't take her either. We don't know what became of her. And even though we've since tried, we don't know what became of DeConte Howard either. There she was outside the gates of the JFK Ebola treatment ward. Impossible not to be drawn in by that long stare or the fact that she seemed in pain, clutching her breast. She's not well. She's sick. Seems she'd brought her Ebola-wracked one-year-old here the day before and didn't know what to do. Was potentially sick herself. She desperately needed to feed her daughter but couldn't get to the baby now behind the gates. She was alone. You just call her and tell her. Even those supposed to be in the know are alone, feel they have to fend for themselves. That, how do I get a treatment? Peering through the gate into a yard filled with Ebola patients was a man that hoping he wasn't to about to become that. one. His name is Alex Gaban. He's a nurse whose partner on the same shift had just contracted the virus. He was flat out terrified he was somehow sick too, just wanted to know if he could get a test. I don't want to even go home. Who's at home? Do you have a family at home? Yeah, I have a family. I have a fiancé that is pregnant. 
Yes. Have you told them? No, I'm not, I'm, not, them? I'm not to her. He stood there for nearly an hour waiting to get someone's attention. It's been a few weeks since we met Alex Caban and we've checked in and he's healthy, which means he's lucky because the statistics in Liberia are stark. Consider that when we first arrived, there were 3,400 cases of Ebola. That number has now jumped to 4,400 cases. It's a conservative estimate because, frankly, people are getting sick faster than anyone can count. They're certainly getting sick faster than anyone can help them. How's this for a bleak spot for an Ebola treatment center? In the shadow of more Liberian ruin, one of 21 centers the Americans are vowing to help build. The 3,000 promised U.S. troops are so far just over 300, working as fast and earnestly as they can, but at this pace, the centers won't be open until at least the end of December. Do the math on how many Liberians will be dead by then. And spare a thought for them. Ebola patients who got themselves as far as the MSF clinic in Monrovia a few weeks ago, but could get no further. There was no room in the unit. Because this door was packed of people until five days ago, full of patients wanting to come in, and that's really very dangerous. It's got to be hard to have to say, <laughs> no, you can't come in, we're not ready quite yeah, yet. People you know? are very having a bad time because they have to say no to a lot of people. Yeah. Before a quick look at the MSF center with Ana Limos, we were struck by another gathering at another gate. Is uh, people looking for a job? Looking for a job? Yeah. There's Are you not. Serious? Yeah, the, the employment rate is very high. Boy, it says a lot about the economy <laughs> here that that people would line up to get a job at an Ebola treatment center. Yeah, but uh, we have also to say that uh, this is one for us, at least one of the safest places in Mohovia. We had 617 staff and no one uh, ever get infected here, as far as we know. That's something to admire. There's actually a lot to admire within these tents. And then, of course, there's Jenna Krona. That day we met her was the day she was being discharged, finally free of the virus. Finally, so poignantly, even lovingly, touched by MSF workers. It was a moment that made us linger and also appeared to make the UN stop and think. Recently, I watched a video of a woman being discharged from an MSF clinic. Her name was Jenna Kroma. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Samantha Power pleading before the General Assembly for the world to do more for West Africa. And until we can promise the same dignified, quality attention that Jenna received to every infected person in the affected countries, we will never get ahead of the outbreak. West Africa's Ebola outbreak is likely the biggest peacetime challenge the UN has ever faced, or so it keeps saying. All that talk while countries rot. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Toronto.